Okay, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let's start. Uh, today is your second lecture in this semester, and uh, we will talk about functional anatomy of human brain. Your previous lecture was dedicated to introduction into central nervous system, and you were talking about um, spinal cord. Today we will continue, and we are going upward, and we study brain. And uh, before we start, we should look in, uh, at this picture, which you have actually seen very many times. Uh, this is a um, process of embryogenesis. And you remember that at the stage of gastrula, embryo consists of three layers. It's multi-layered embryo, uh, and the outer layer is named ectoderm, and middle layer is named mesoderm, and internal layer it is endoderm. So nerve cells, nervous tissue is derived from ectoderm, that is outer layer, together with epidermal cells of skin, and uh, pigment cells also. And you also remember that uh, type of nervous system for humans and all the highest animals, it is tubular type. And process of formation of a nervous system uh, in humans and in highest animals, it is named neurulation or process of neural tube formation. It passes through several stages. So before the final formation of neural tube, several stages should pass. And so the first stage, it is formation of a neural plate. Um, ectoderm, as a dorsal part of the ectoderm, some cells, a group of cells, starts to uh, rapidly proliferate. And with the time, they form a thickening that is named neural plate. Uh, with the time, cells which are located in the center of this neural plate, they start moving deeper inside the embryo, so they begin to invaginate, and the next stage is named neural groove. Margins of neural groove are known as neural folds. Uh, after that, uh, neural folds, they start moving towards each other and they close the groove and they transform it into neural tube. This is the third stage and so it is final stage of neural tube formation. The process starts um, and this, uh, the whole process lasts for one week only. So it starts from the implantation. Um, time and uh, within uh, one week it's actually complete. After that, on the fourth week of embryonic development, on the cranial end of the neural tube, uh, another enlargement appears and this enlargement will later give origin to the brain. On the fourth week of embryonic development, this enlargement consists of three uh, brain vesicles or primary brain vesicles. For, it's for brain or prosencephalon, the anterior one, then midbrain or mesencephalon, and hindbrain or rhombencephalon. On the fifth week, um, the three brain vesicles, primary brain vesicles, are further divided and they form secondary brain vesicles. They are five. So prosencephalon is divided into two, telencephalon and diencephalon. And then midbrain is, or mesencephalon is not divided and it gives origin to the midbrain finally. And rhombencephalon is divided into metencephalon that gives origin to pons and cerebellum and myelencephalon that gives origin to the medulla oblongata. So telencephalon from the... Um, brain or from prosencephalon will later form cerebral hemispheres and so diencephalon gives origin to structures of diencephalon. When you start describing any part of the brain, the very first thing 
as always, you should put this part of the brain into an atomic position. And the second thing, you should tell about its embryogenesis. So from which brain vesicle it is divided at the stage of primary brain vesicles and from which brain vesicle it is developed at the stage of secondary brain vesicles. So during evolution, uh, brain underwent especially great development. So you uh, definitely know that a brain of humans is very different uh, from the brain of frogs and from the brain of reptiles. And uh, the difference is not only in the size, though it matters. Yes, um, some structures of human brain, they were developed more significantly than the other. And now we will talk about it. What doesn't leave us any doubts is that currently, nowadays, on the planet of Earth, human is a crown of evolution. Uh, brain of humans is mostly developed and it gives us um, actually nearly limitless opportunities. So we can study, um, we can invent something uh, new, uh, we can facilitate our lives by different ways and we should use this opportunity. A size of the brain and capacity, volume, weight of the brain in humans um, got increased during evolution. But still, size is not the main thing. So size matters, but not that much. There are species on the planet Earth uh, whose weight of brain is much larger than in humans. For example, if average weight of human brain comprises 1.5 kilos, uh, in elephants, it is about 5 kilos. And in whales, it reaches even 9 kilos. Uh, we shouldn't consider only absolute brain size. Uh, we should pay an attention at the relative brain size, so ratio between weight of brain, capacity of brain, and weight of the whole um, species, the whole creature, yes? If to compare this, then actually for the humans, we will be the leaders, yes, of, of uh, brain sizes. And what is especially important, even more than weight of the brain, we should count number of neurons. Uh, despite the fact that the uh, brain of the elephant, um, weight of the elephant's brain is larger than weight of human brain, number of neurons in elephant's brain is much smaller. So in human's brain, in average, it is 16.3 billion neurons, and in elephants, it's 5.6 just billion neurons. And what is even more important, yes, number of neurons was increased, but what was even more increased, it is number of interneuronal connections, and we will talk about it later. So in this interneuronal connections, we are undisputable leaders. So human brain is, has the largest amount of interneuronal connections. Last year, in the lecture of craniology, we were discussing the structure of skull also underwent great changes during evolution. Uh, if in ancient uh, apes and in ancient humans even, facial skull was developed much better than um, cerebral skull, so viscerocranium was developed better than neurocranium, then in Homo sapiens, in modern people, neurocranium uh, is developed much better. So uh, capacity, volume of cranial cavity was increased due to the um, enlargement of the brain, increasing of, of the brain size. Uh, whereas sizes of viscerocranium, they were decreased because um, humans invented special devices to eat, to cut the food into pieces, yes? So we don't need such well-developed teeth, such well-developed jaws, and that's why facial skull was decreased and uh, neurocranium was uh, increased significantly. 
And this fact we should also remember. So our head is given to us not only to wear caps, even apes are able for that. Our heads are given to us to use our brain uh, wisely and uh, to do our best for the humanity and um, maybe to give to make some new discoveries in the future so to help humanity in its development if we look at the um, evolution of human brain we will see that um, comparatively recently like about six thousand yes six million sorry years ago um, brain of a human ancestors um, was weight of uh, hu human uh, weight of brain of human ancestors was only about 500 grams and during this five million years it was increased and now uh, in Homo sapiens, uh, actually um, size is the same like in Homo neanderthalis, in Homo sapiens, weight of human brain is about 0 0.5 kilos. So which exactly neuroanatomical changes were observed during human evolution? So definitely increasing in absolute and all especially relative brain sizes. So yes, weight of the brain was increased but also ratio between weight of the brain and weight of the whole creature, the whole human, was also increased. Larger proportion of white matter to gray matter. So that's what I was uh, telling you about before. Interneuronal, number of interneuronal connections was especially increased. And all these connections are formed by fibers. All of these fibers, they are white matter. So certainly, Mm, proportion of white matter to gray matter was also increased. Uh, not all the parts of a brain uh, underwent the same development. A special development, a special increasing was observed in the telencephalon and more specifically neocortex. So a telencephalon, it is the first one. The second one, the second part of the brain stem that uh, brain, sorry, that also was um, developed significantly, it is cerebellum. And uh, the other thing that is very important, that we should never forget, it is high degree of cortical folding. So why do we need this fold? Yes, when we studied digestive system, we said that um, in the mucosa of digestive tract in small intestine, there are numerous folds, circular folds, and they are very high. Uh, and we were saying that it is necessary to activate, to make parietal digestion more active. So the more folds is present, the more common length of mucosa of the uh, intestines, yes, of a small intestine. So that's why when you pack your packed your bag to come finally to Russia, uh, you also use the same method. The more folds you will make with your clothes, with your things, yes, the more things will be inserted, will be placed into your bag, into your luggage, yes, and that's why to also increase again surface area in the brain uh, surface of cerebral hemispheres as well as surface of cerebellum uh, is not smooth it forms very many folds and they are sometimes very deep so these um, folds they contribute to increasing of surface area and so the more folds the more cortex is present and cortex it's a structure of gray matter in the brain, in some parts of the brain. So the more cortex, the more neuron bodies, the better brain is developed, yes? And because um, a skull of the human cannot increase its sizes limitlessly, um, because during labor, 
this skull of the fetus should pass through the female pelvis and female pelvis also cannot increase its size limitlessly. So that's why faults are well developed in some parts of human brain, such as cerebellum and cerebral hemispheres. Cerebellum and cerebral hemispheres. Okay. So we'll start with the structures of brain stem. And actually today, yes, we will discuss, try to discuss all the structures of brain except telencephalon. So brain stem includes the following structures. It is medulla oblongata. Then above it, there is the pons. And above the medulla oblongata, there is midbrain. That continues to the uh, diencephalon. We will start with <laughs> medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata, in Latin it is a bulbus cerebri or myelencephalon. So at the stage of primary brain vesicles, it was developed from uh, pros, sorry, rhombencephalon. At the stage of secondary brain vesicles, it was developed from uh, myelencephalon. Medulla oblongata is a continuation of spinal cord. And that's why in the external surface of medulla oblongata, in the external structure of medulla oblongata, there are very many similarities with spinal cord, though there are also some differences. Uh, so on the ventral surface, this is ventral surface, in the very middle, we can see anterior median fissure, just like in the spinal cord, fissura mediana anterior. Uh, laterally from it, there are two elevations which are named pyramids. Later we will say that these pyramids are formed by fibers of corticospinal tract that is named pyramidal tract. It starts from the cortex of cerebral hemispheres and it goes downward to the anterior nuclei, nuclei of anterior horn of the spinal cord. Laterally from the pyramids, uh, there is the rump, pied, anterolateral sulci, sulcus anterolateralis. Uh, anterolateral sulcus corresponds to the anterolateral sulcus of spinal cord. In the anterior median fissure, uh, at the level of foramen magnum, we can see a decussation of fibers. These fibers uh, decussate, mm, these are the decussations of fibers of corticospinal tract, and this decussation serves as a boundary between medulla oblongata and spinal cord. Laterally from anterolateral sulcus, there is another elevation that is named olive. Olive is formed by inferior olivary nucleus. We will uh, talk about it when we reach internal structure. And laterally from the olive, there is retroolivary sulcus or in other its name, posterolateral sulcus. Posterolateral sulcus does not correspond to posterolateral sulcus of the spinal cord. It is located more anteriorly. Okay, that's what we can see on the ventral surface. Boundary between medulla oblongata and the pons is presented by ponta medullary junction, from which uh, roots of cranial nerves, 6, 7, and 8 piers mm, arise. Dorsal surface of medulla oblongata is presented mm, forms, uh, rhomboid fossa, it is the flow of the fourth ventricle, we will talk about it later. So in the internal structure of medulla oblongata, we should, uh, before we start discussion, we should understand one thing. So when you studied spinal cord, you were saying that in the very center, there is a cavity of spinal cord that is named central canal because it is located in the center. Yes. And you also were saying that sensory tracts and sensory nuclei of spinal cord, they occupy predominantly posterior parts and motor tract and motor nuclei, they occupy predominantly anterior parts. In brainstem, in structures of brainstem, 
we observe a displacement of the cavity and not only cavity um, displacement of structures yes so cavity uh, re, um, gets displaced dorsally yes so cavity of the rhombocephalon it is fourth ventricle and it is located dorsally from medulla oblongata and then posterior parts of medulla oblongata the posterior part is ruptured and moves to the sides to the sides that's why in the medulla oblongata and in the pons we will observe um, a little bit different arrangement of structures so sensory tracts and sensory nuclei will be located laterally because they were displaced yes and motor tracts and motor nuclei will be located medially okay uh, in any part of brain in any part of cns internal structure when you describe internal structure you should say that uh, gray and white matter is distinguished and gray matter is presented by neuron bodies you were talking about it uh, at your practical classes yes and at the previous lecture and white matter is formed by exons or fibers yes processes of neurons so gray matter um, and these neuron bodies in gray matter they are not diffusely located yes they are arranged into nuclei so gray matter in the medulla oblongata is presented by four groups of nuclei the first group of nuclei uh, these are nuclei of posterior funiculi they are nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus when you studied spinal cord you were saying that posterior funiculus is occupied by two fascicles fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus these two fascicles are formed by bulbothalamic tract that carries fibers proprioceptive fibers about location in the space contraction of the muscles um, so fasciculus gracilis as it is located more medially collects fibers from lower part of the body and fasciculus cuneatus that it is located more laterally collects fibers from lateral part of the body they move upward and they reach medulla oblongata here in the medulla oblongata there are homonymous nuclei so nuclei of the same name these fibers exons they form synapses on the neurons of this nuclei exons of these neurons which form nuclei so exons of second order neurons of bulbocelemic tract they form decussation they decussate at the level of medulla oblongata and they continue moving upward uh, to the salamus and they form structure that is named medial limniscus limniscus medialis the second group of nuclei uh, sorry about yes uh, let's say a few words about medial limniscus so it's as the name it's rails band or rails ribbon so medial limniscus is formed by group of axons of second neurons of bulbocelemic tract so from nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus here you can see that uh, at the level of medulla oblongata fibers decussate they form medial limniscus that goes up what passes through the pons midbrain reaches the salamus ventrolateral nuclei of salamus where they again form synapses and um, in the ventrolateral nuclei of salamus there are bodies of third order neurons for bulbothalamic tract and its axons move upward until they reach cortex um, if to be more precise they reach cortex of post uh, central gyrus we'll talk about it later Uh, the second group of nuclei in medulla oblongata is presented by olivary nuclei. We were saying about this elevation 
that is named olive. Um, yes, and so uh, it is formed by olivary nuclei. Olivary nuclei participate in regulation of muscular tone together with basal nuclei and together with cerebellum. So from this olivary nuclei, uh, olivary cerebellar fibers start and they enter cerebellum. So without, um, in case of any pathology of olivary nuclei, or its exact name is inferior olivary nucleus, in case of any pathology of inferior olivary nucleus, patient will suffer from like vibrations, shivering, yes, like, and movements will not be that much precise. So that is the, in case of pathology of a library nucleus. The third group of nuclei um, forms reticular formation. Actually, a reticular formation, reticulum means network, yes? So network structure. Uh, why it's named? Why does it have such a name? Because it is diffuse mass of neurons and nerve fibers that make the core of the brainstem. So density of the neurons in this reticular formation is not as high as it is in the nuclei. But because they together form the same function, they are united together in such a structure as reticular formation. So they run through medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. And in the salamus, there are reticular nuclei also, uh, where this fibers from reticular formation end. So there are nuclei of medullary reticular formation, pontine reticular formation, and midbrain reticular formation. It is a loose network of nuclei, which contains for medulla oblongata, it contains vital centers such as cardiac center, respiratory center, vasomotor center. There is also sneezing, coughing center here, and swallowing center as well. So all of this um, unconditional reflexes, it is a function of reticular formation of the medulla oblongata. Also neurons of medulla oblongata act as intermediate neurons for this um, unconditional reflexes. And so the fourth group of nuclei of medulla oblongata, these are nuclei of cranial nerves. For medulla oblongata, um, yes, nuclei of cranial nerves from the 9th to the 12th peer, uh, peers are located here. So these are glossopharyngeal and vagus and accessory and also um, hypoglossal nerve. That is a function of medulla oblongata. Uh, white matter of medulla oblongata is presented by ascending or efferent and descending or efferent pathways. So among the ascending pathways, we can call uh, fasciculus gratulis and cuneatus. It is bulbosalamic tract and spinocerebellar tract, anterior and posterior, and spinothalamic tract, also lateral and anterior. Descending tracts are the following. It is corticospinal which we, we are talking about, yes, that forms um, pyramid here, anteriorly, it forms pyramid, this elevation. And then uh, there is uh, there are medial, and let, uh, medial and dorsal longitudinal bundles, we'll talk about it later, tectospinal tract, rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal and vestibular spinal. All of these tracts, except corticospinal, they are extra pyramid, and so they regulate our movements. And uh, we can see that mainly uh, sensory tracts are located laterally and motor tracts are mainly located medially. Okay, pons. Pons is the next part of the brain stem. And so at the stage of primary brain vesicles, this developed again from the rhomboencephalon. And at the stage of secondary brain vesicles, it was developed from metencephalon uh, together with cerebellum. So pons, if to translate it uh, from Latin, it means bridge. So if we look at the medulla oblongata, we will see that it is oblongata. Yes, its longitudinal sizes, they are larger than its transverse sizes. 
Then for the for the pons, it looks like a bridge between two cerebral cerebral hemispheres, and it's vice versa. It transfers fibers are. It transfers sizes. It transfers sizes larger than its longitudinal size. In this diagram, we also can see. Uh, regarding, let's return a little bit to medulla oblongata, that anterolateral sulcus, it is a place of exit of the roots of hypoglossal nerve, whereas posterior lateral sulcus is a place of exit of the roots of glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory nerves. And here we can see pontomedullary junction is a place of exit of abducens nerve, facial nerve, and vestibular cochlea nerve. No. Okay, and here in the pons, in the very center, we can see a longitudinal groove that is named basilar sulcus, yes, for basilar artery, and we also can see uh, transversely oriented fibers. These transversely oriented fibers are ponta cerebellar fibers. Laterally, they continue to middle cerebellar peduncles, and they enter cerebellum. They start from pontine nuclei of the pons and they enter cerebellum to, um, again, to correct movement somehow. A boundary between pons and middle cerebellar peduncles corresponds to the place of exit of the roof, root of the fifth pair of cranial nerves, that is, trigeminal nerve. Here we can see it. In the sagittal section of the brain, um, pons is can be uh, located can be um, demonstrated here in this part in this part so dorsal surface of pons and medulla oblongata they form rhomboid fossa that is a floor of the fourth ventricle skeletotopy of medulla oblongata and pons is the same both of them are located in the clivus Clivus is formed by fusion of body of sphenoid bone and basal part of the occipital bone. Okay. Um, in the internal structure of pons, we can uh, identify three parts. The most ventral part it is basal part, pars basilaris. Then the most dorsal part it is tegmental part tegmental part, and between them there is trapezoid body, trapezoid body. So because there are very many structures here, we will mm, discuss each of them one by one, and we'll start with basal part. Uh, so again, just like in medulla oblongata, internal structure is presented by gray and white matter. And if we talk about basal part of the pons, gray matter is presented only by one group of nuclei, that is nuclei propri pontis, proper nuclei of the pons. Here we can see them. Uh, they are very small. So these nuclei, they are like um, a transducer, something like that, yes? Uh, so fibers from the cortex, they move downward to send a signal to the muscles of our body, but some fibers form synapses on this nuclei, pontine nuclei, because from this pontine nuclei, uh, fibers will enter cerebellum. Uh, as cerebellum is the main organ of balance, um, cerebellum will correct the movements and uh, make it make them more precise. Yes, so that is the function of pontine nuclei. Uh, in white matter, we can distinguish transversely oriented ponta cerebellar fibers. Here we can see them. They are located very superficially, and so they start from pontine nuclei and they move laterally, enter through middle cerebellar peduncles, cerebellum, and reach cortex of cerebellum. And there are three tracts which are longitudinally oriented. These are corticospinal tract that continues downward to the medulla oblongata and forms pyramid, yes? Corticonuclear tract that starts from the cortex of cerebral hemispheres and ends in the motor nuclei of cranial nerves. And corticopontine tract 
that tract about which I have already told you that starts from the cortex of cerebral hemispheres and ends in the pontine nuclei of the pons. So here it's simple, right? Uh, in the tegmentum, in the tegmentum, um, gray matter is presented by nuclei of cranial nerves from the fifth uh, to the eighth piers. Um, yes, in the medulla oblongata, it was from the ninth to the twelfth piers, and in the pons, it is from the fifth uh, to the eighth piers. And also a uh, reticular formation is present here that regulates sleeping and awakeness cycle, yes, and it inhibits some excessive stimulations and so on. A white matter is presented mostly by efferent pathways because efferent, all of them pass in the basilar part, yes? So it is spinocerebellar anterior tract and spinothalamic tract, nucleothalamic tract, bulbothalamic tract. Uh, when we um, discussed medulla oblongata, we said that uh, fibers of bulbar salamic tract, they decussate at the level of medulla oblongata, and they form medial limniscus. In some books, uh, you will see um, that such an opinion, that medial limniscus is formed not only by bulbar salamic, but also by nuclear salamic and spinothalamic tract. In some books, it's written that bulbar salamic forms medial limniscus, nuclear salamic tract forms trigeminal limniscus, because mainly it starts from nuclear of trigeminal nerve, and spinal salamic tract forms spinal limniscus. So you should be aware about these two existing opinions, and you should justify your answer um, in case if you choose one, one of these options. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Алло. Не, у меня лекция. Окей, so let's continue. Uh, these are the tracts. And a trapezoid body uh, is formed by both, also gray matter and white matter. So, um, what is it trapezoid body and how is it formed we said that um, here in the pons there are nuclei of the cranial nerves from the fifth to the eighth spheres and the eight, eighth sphere of cranial nerves it is a vestibular cochlear nerve that is responsible its vestibular part is responsible for balance and equilibrium and its cochlear part is responsible for the hearing so for the cochlear part, uh, there are two nuclei, dorsal cochlear nucleus and ventral cochlear nucleus. Fibers that start, which start from both of these nuclei, they also decussate. Actually, later, when you study deeply the brain, you will see that many fibers decussate. Majority of the fibers decussate. It is created to make duplicate the function yes like in case of the loss of one part of the brain uh, the other part of the brain will stay and it can substitute its function yes so this fibers decussate uh, but uh, fibers from dorsal cochlear nucleus they decussate on the dorsal surface very close right on the dorsal surface of the pons and they form medullary stria which we can easily see on the dorsal surface of the rhomboid fossa fibers from ventral cochlear nucleus they decussate in the depth and they form a trapezoid body both of these fibers they form synapses with anterior and posterior nuclei of trapezoid body and after that they join together and they form lateral limniscus. So lateral limniscus or auditory limniscus is formed by auditory fibers from cochlear nuclei to the contralateral inferior colliculus of the midbrain. This thing we will discuss later. So another name of nuclei of trapezoid body, it is superior alivary nucleus. That's why previous one that is in the medulla oblongata, it was inferior alivary nucleus and uh, the, this one it is superior 
alivary nucleus. So that was about internal structure of the bones. The next cerebellum. Cerebellum, uh, also at the stage of uh, primary brain vesicles, was developed from rhomboencephalon and this, at the stage of secondary brain vesicles, uh, together with pons, it was developed from metencephalon. So cerebellum, if to translate it from Latin, it will be like small brain. Cerebrum means brain. Cerebellum means small brain. Yes? Because um, when we look at it, from the first point of view, from the very first uh, point of view, we can say that, yes, indeed, it is very similar with uh, cerebral hemispheres. Because, first of all, it, con it consists of two hemispheres, uh, right and left, cerebellar hemisphere, that is connected by vermis in the middle. The second thing is that surface of the cerebellum is not smooth, just like in cerebral hemispheres. And it is um, due to the peculiarities of structure of gray matter in both of these uh, parts of brain. It is due to the presence of the cortex. We have already discussed it, yes? The more folds, the more cortex. Cortex is neuron bodies, yes? So cerebellum and cerebral hemispheres, they are two parts of brain which in which gray matter is presented not only by nuclei but also by the cortex and so if we make a sagittal section just like in this picture if we make a sagittal section of cerebellum we will see that cortex uh, or gray matter surrounds white matter from outside but also inside the gray matter uh, inside the white matter there are nuclei so it's like a layered structure, yes? And so this mm, very beautiful pattern in the internal structure of cerebellum, ancient anatomists called arbor vita, or tree of life, tree of life. So cerebellum, as we can see in this diagram, is uh, located in the posterior cranial fossa, just like pons and medulla oblongata. But pons and medulla oblongata, they occupy anterior part of posterior cranial fossa, clivus, that is located in front of the foramen magnum. Um, cerebellum is located behind the foramen magnum, but below groove for the transverse sinus. So that's where cerebellum is located. Above the cerebellum, there, is, there are occipital lobes of cerebral hemispheres. In front of cerebellum, there is cavity of rhomboencephalon, fourth ventricle. So cerebellum um, is located aside, not on the main road from the spinal cord to the cerebral hemispheres. It also um, defines some of its peculiarities, like, for example, presence of the cerebellar peduncles, which serve for the connection between cerebellum and the other structures of the brain. So here in this um, picture, we again see sagittal section, and we can see, see that, yes, there are cerebellar hemispheres and vermis as well, like the main part of the cerebellum and here in this parts of cerebellum both gray and white matter is present uh, and also there are cerebellar peduncles superior cerebellar peduncles for the connection with the midbrain middle cerebellar peduncles for the connection with the pons and inferior cerebellar peduncles for connection with the medulla oblongata all the cerebellar peduncles they are formed completely by white matter, only white matter. So these are only tracts uh, which enter and leave cerebellum. There are no accidental tracts, yes? I mean, there are no tracts which just pass through cerebellum. If tract, if fibers come to the cerebellum, like if fibers enter cerebellum, means they will end here. And if all the fibers which um, live through cerebellar peduncles, they began in the cerebellum. So there, is, there are not accidental tracts which just came here by luck.
Yes. In uh, Pons and Midala Blangatas, there are tracts we just pass. They do not form any synopsis here. But in Cerebellum, everything is nothing is accidental. Nothing is accidental. So gray matter is presented by cortex and nuclei. And structure of cerebellar cortex is actually very primitive uh, if to compare it with the structure of cerebral hemispheres. Um, there are only three layers in it. Uh, the most superficial layer, it is molecular layer. The second one, it is Purkinje cell layer that is formed by Purkinje cells on which ascending tracts or efferent tracts um, of cerebellum end. And the third layer, it is granular cell layer that is presented by fibers, Purkinje cell axons, and also small uh, granule cells layer. That is the stru structure of the cortex. Among the nuclei, four are distinguished. Um, the most medial one, it is vestigial nucleus. Here we can see it. All of them are paired, yes? Then uh, slightly laterally, there is globosus nucleus. Nucleus globosus. Globus means like a circle, yes? A, yes, circle, like a ball. Uh, then uh, there is emboliform nucleus. And the most lateral is a dentate nucleus, nucleus dentatus. So it has mm, like dense means like teeth, like tooth, yes? And so it is um, a peculiarity of the structure of the dentine nucleus. It, it is formed by teeth, by numerous teeth. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I told you that uh, cerebellum also underwent rapid development during evolution because First of all, animals, they left water and they came to the land, yes? And it required additional skills. Like if fish just was swimming, now we need to work, uh, jump, run. So we need to have very many abilities. And that's why cerebellum um, underwent great development. In the evolution of cerebellum, three stages can be observed. So the most ancient cerebellum or paleocerebellum, so that cerebellum which was distinguished even in ancient animals, it is the most medial part. And uh, vestigial nucleus belongs to it. And it is presented by one of the lobular vermis, that is nodule, yes? And small medial part of cerebellum, cerebellar hemispheres, that is named flocculus. So floccular nodular part of cerebellum, it is paleocerebellum, the most ancient cerebellum. And uh, inside this follicular nodular part, vestigial nucleus is located. Uh, then the second, it is archicerebellum. Archicerebellum is presented by the rest part of vermis, and it includes globose nucleus as well as emboliform nucleus. And the newest part of neocerebellum, these are cerebellar hemispheres. Here we can see them. Uh, it was developed, the last one, recently, comparatively recently, and it includes dentate nucleus, nucleus dentatus. Um, if to look at our body, to, to the evolution of the body structures, we will see that trunk is more ancient structure than the limbs, yes? So that's why um, fibers which come from the muscles of the trunk and follow to the muscles of the trunk, they are connected with paleocerebellum and archicerebellum. And fibers from the limbs and to the limbs, they are connected with neocerebellum. So that, that, is a dif that is the difference in the structures of these uh, three parts. Uh, you have to know which exactly tracts pass through each cerebellar peduncles. So through superior peduncles to and from the midbrain, anterior spinous cerebellar tract passes, dentate rubral tract, and dentate thalamic tract. Through the middle cerebellar peduncles um, that which connect cerebellum and pons, only pontocerebellar tract passes, the only one. 
but it is very big tract because middle cell cerebellar peduncles are the largest peduncles. And through the inferior peduncles, which connect cerebellum and medulla oblongata, uh, there are both uh, ascending and descending tracts. So they are posterior spinal cerebellum, bulba cerebellum, oliva cerebellum, vestibular cerebellum, nuclear cerebellum, and all of them are ascending, yes, and descending, which move in the opposite direction. These are cerebellar library, cerebellar vestibular, and cerebellar reticulum tracts. So you have to know it. Uh, that was a general information about cerebellum. Now midbrain, uh, mesencephalon. So mesencephalon, it is the only brain vesicle that is not divided at the stage of secondary brain vesicles. So at both stages, uh, primary and secondary brain vesicles, midbrain is developed from mesencephalon. Mesencephalon. So in, uh, if we look at the sagittal section, we will see midbrain here. That's it. So below it, there is pons and medulla oblongata. And behind there is cerebellum, yes. So uh, we said that cavity of the fourth, cavity of the rhomboencephalon, it is fourth ventricle. And here we can see it. It has a tent-like structure, like a tent. And cavity of the midbrain is very narrow. It is cerebral aqueduct, cerebral aqueduct. And um, dorsal part, everything that is located dorsally from cerebral aqueduct, it is tectum mesencephaly or quadri, um, quadrilamina plate um, that is presented by four colliculi, two superior and two inferior colliculi. And ventral part of the midbrain that is located ventrally from the cerebral aqueduct is formed uh, by cerebral peduncles. So here we can see ventral aspect, inferior aspect of the midbrain. And here we can see um, cerebral peduncles. And between two cerebral peduncles, there is a triangular fossa that is named interpeduncular fossa. Fossa interpedunculares. It is occupied by posterior perforated substance, substanza perforata posterior. It is named perforated because it has numerous openings in it for passage of vessels and nerves. It is triangular, yes. And so medial surfaces of cerebral peduncles, they have oculomotor groove, sulcus oculomotorius, from which Ocular motor nerves start. It is third pair of cranial nerves. In front of posterior perforated substance, there are mammillary bodies, but mammillary bodies are parts of diencephalon. So from the dorsal surface, we can see tectum mesencephaly. It is presented by two pairs of colliculi, two superior and two inferior. Superior colliculi are subcortical centers of vision, and inferior colliculi are subcortical centers of hearing. Between two colliculi and a little bit below them, there is a place that is called frenulum uh, of superior medullary veil. Superior medullary veil is stretched between two superior cerebellar peduncles, and it forms anterior superior part of the roof of the fourth ventricle. And so this frenulum, also this place, at the same time serves as a place of the exit of the roots of the trochlear nerve, fourth pair of cranial nerves. Trochlear nerve is the only nerve that arises on the dorsal surface of brainstem. All the other nerves arise from its uh, ventral surface. So in the internal structure, Again, just like in the external, we can distinguish two parts. So that part that is located dorsally from the sylvian aqueduct, it is named tectum mesencephaly. Then uh, that part that is located ventrally, it is um, cruz cerebri or cerebral peduncles. In the cerebral peduncles, we can divide into two parts by a substantia nigra. Here we can see it, substantia nigra or black substance. 
um, ventrally from the substantia nigra, uh, there are tracts. Uh, there is base of cruz cerebri, basis cruz cerebri, and dorsally from it there is tegmental part. Tegmental part. So this base of cruz cerebri is presented only by white matter, and all the tracts which pass uh, through this base of cruz cerebri, they are descending, and all of them start from the cortex. Conditionally, we can divide this base of cruz cerebri into five parts. And uh, the most medial one-fifth is occupied by frontopontine fibers, which go to the start from the cortex of frontal lobe of cerebral hemispheres, and they end in the pontine nuclei of the pons, about which we have already uh, talked. The most lateral one-fifth is occupied by occipital parieta tempora pontine fibers, which start from the cortex of occipital parietal um, occipital, parietal, and temporal loop. Occipital, parietal, uh, and temporal loop, and they end in the pontine nuclei of the pons also. And so this middle part is occupied by cortica uh, nuclei and cortica spinal tract. A slightly medial is this cortical nuclear tract that starts from the cortex of cerebral hemispheres and goes to modern nuclei of cranial nerves. And laterally, uh, like that tract that occupies two fifths, it is cortical spinal tract that you remember moves downward, passes through pons, medulla oblongata, where it forms pyramid. Yes, after that, its fibers form the as the lower boundary of the medulla oblongata. Um, so, um, medial part is occupied by the fibers which follow to the upper limb and to the upper part of the body, and lateral part is occupied by the fibers which follow to the lower limb and to the lower part of the body. So, that is the structure uh, of the base of cerebral peduncles. Sorry. Uh, these are descending tracts. Ascending tracts are located in the tegmental part, and they are very close to the lateral surface. They lie very superficially, and on the lateral surface of the midbrain, we even can notice limniscal trigon, a place where all of these ascending tracts are very, cl very closely located to the surface. Ascending tracts form limnisci just like in the pons, yes? So there is a lateral limniscus that is formed by auditory fibers, medial limniscus that is formed by um, bulbosalamic tract, spinal limniscus that is formed by spinosalamic tract, and trigeminal limniscus that is formed by uh, nucleosalamic tract. Gray matter is again presented by four groups of nuclei. Uh, first group of nuclei, these are nuclei of cranial nerves, and here in the midbrain, there are nuclei of only two pairs of cranial nerves. Third pair of cranial nerves, it is oculomotor nerve, and its nuclei are located at the level of superior colliculi, that's what we can see here. And um, nuclei of trochlear nerve are located at the level of the inferior colliculus. The second is reticular formation. Reticular formation uh, performs the same functions as it performs in the medulla oblongata, in the pons, so now it is in the midbrain. And there is one special function. Uh, there are some, there are two nuclei of reticular formation which are larger than the others. They are named Kajal nucleus and Darkshevich nucleus. From this nuclei, medial longitudinal bundle starts and it goes downward to the spinal cord. It is responsible for simultaneous turn of the uh, eyes, head, and neck to the same side. Okay. Uh, then uh, there are two nuclei which belong to extrapyramidal system. So those nuclei which regulate muscular tone, for example. That is red nucleus. Here we can see it. And also substantia nigra or black substance. So they have such names due to the presence of the iron or melanin, both iron and melanin in it, 
Uh, so black substance contains large amount of melanin and red nucleus contains small amount of melanin. Anyway, uh, both of them are connected with basal nuclei of cerebral hemispheres and um, after that with cerebellum and uh, with the library nuclei and so with all the structures which are responsible for regulation of muscular tone. Any pathology in red nucleus or in a substantia nigra causes Parkinson's disease. It is a disease when also movements are not precise, so patient always moves by his small muscles. There is always contraction of small muscles, so he cannot even eat himself. Yes, so that is a problem. And the fourth group of nuclei, it is tactile nucleus that is located in the tectum. Uh, in the tectum, here we can see it. So uh, fibers which start from tactile nuclei, they decussate. They form dorsal tegmental decussation or Maynard's decussation. Uh, after that, they form, no, not after that, right after the beginning, they form tectospinal tract. This tectospinal tract starts from tactile nuclei and it moves downward to the spinal cord and it is responsible for defensive reflexes. So movement, movements um, away from the source of strong sound or strong light or maybe even strong smell, yes, and so on. So these are defensive reflexes. Actually, fibers which start from the red nucleus, they form rubrospinal tract and they also decussate. So they form ventral tegmental decussation or forelis decussation. For else, the position. <clears throat> uh, diencephalon. That was about the midbrain, yes? Now about diencephalon or interbrain. Uh, at the stage of primary brain vesicles, it was developed from prosencephalon. And at the stage of secondary brain vesicles, it is uh, developed from diencephalon. So uh, all the structures of brain stem all the parts of brain which we might see previously, uh, they are clearly visible, yes, in the whole brain. But diencephalon is covered from nearly all the sides by cerebral hemispheres. And on the uh, base of the brain, in the base of the brain, we can see only very few structures of hypothalamus. The other structures become visible only after the removal of cerebral hemispheres. But anyway, here it is, diencephalon, yes, or interbrain. In the diencephalon, three parts are distinguished. Upper part, it is salamic brain or salamencephalon. A lower part is hypothalamus. Boundary between salamencephalon and hypothalamus passes through the hypothalamic sulcus, sulcus hypothalamicus. And so cavity of the um, diencephalon is the third ventricle. It is unpaired. It is located like here, yes? Medially from the um, medial surfaces of salamus here, between two sala salami, yes? Okay, so we will start from salamic brain or salamencephalon. It includes three parts, salamus itself, first of all, uh, epithalamus and metasalamus. So metasalamus is presented by two structures. This is medial geniculate body. That is a subcortical center of hearing together with inferior colliculus. And lateral geniculate body, that is subcortical center of vision together with superior colliculus. Here we can see it. It is located, they are located laterally from colliculi. So superior colliculus, by means of brachium, the structure is named brachium, is connected with lateral geniculate body. So superior colliculus together with lateral geniculate body, uh, they are subcortical centers of vision. Inferior colliculus by means of brachium also is connected with medial geniculate body. Inferior colliculus and medial geniculate body are subcortical centers of hearing. Uh, structures of epithalamus are presented by epiphysis or pineal gland. 
Yes? And then there are habenula trigons, habenuli, and habenula commissia. Habenula commissia. Epiphysis or pineal gland, it is unpaired um, endocrine gland that produces melatonin. So serotonin is um, projected in the intestines, for example, and pineal gland at a definite time of the day begins transforming uh, serotonin into melatonin. And usually the largest amount of melatonin uh, in the human body is observed between 1 and 5 a.m. A function of pineal gland is to regulate circadian rhythms. So it regulates uh, day and night cycles. Uh, melatonin also inhibits early puberty. So in, it inhibits early sexual maturation. And so it regulates also timing of sleep, body temperature, appetite. So melatonin is secreted during darkness. So that's why if you, when you sleep, uh, you shouldn't sleep with lights, yes? You shouldn't sleep with TV is or even TV is on or maybe laptop is also on. Um, everything should be switched off. You should sleep in a complete darkness for better production of melatonin. So melatonin is also potent antioxidant. So it also inhibits aging. Yes, it makes us young forever mm -hmm. and melatonin yes a level of melatonin is high at in people with young age and with an age it is reduced so that's why we know that in elder people there are problems with sleeping they even need to um, intake some medicines to sleep better salamus salamus is a paired structure uh, it is a structure of gray matter so it is avoided in shape it is the main subcortical center of all types of sensation. It is avoided in shape, and so its anterior margin is sharpened, and its posterior margin is like rounded, and uh, it's not margin, sorry, pole. Posterior pole is rounded, and it is named pulvinar. So all the nuclei, it is, it is a structure of gray matter, yes, and all the nuclei of thalamus can be divided into six groups, anterior, posterior, medial, median, uh, ventrolateral, and also reticular nuclei. Uh, anterior nuclei are subcortical centers of infection. Ventrolateral nuclei are subcortical centers of uh, general sensation. Posterior nuclei are subcortical centers of vision. Median nuclei are subcortical centers of vestibular and auditory functions. Reticular nuclei are subcortical sensory centers of reticular formation. And medial nuclei are subcortical centers of extrapyramidal system. And it is integration center of uh, diencephalon. So all the fibers from the other five groups of nuclei of thalamus, they come uh, here to the medial nuclei. Hypothalamus is located below the hypothalamic sulcus, yes? And so um, from the external surface, we can observe three parts. It is optic chiasm, and then it is a pituitary gland that by means of infundibulum is attached to the tuber cinereum. And behind it, uh, there are mammillary bodies, which serve as Mm, subcortical centers of olfaction together with the anterior nuclei of thalamus. In the internal structure, we can distinguish four groups of nuclei. Anterior group of nuclei, that is preoptic, because it is above the optic chiasm, yes, preoptic, supraoptic, and paraventricular nuclei, they produce two hormones. 
It is oxytocin and vasopressin, or its other name is antidiuretic hormone. Uh, these two hormones, they, along the infundibulum, moves downward and uh, are stored in the posterior lobe of pituitary gland. <clears throat> uh, middle group of nuclei that is located in the tuber cinereum, in the great tuber, they are responsible in production of uh, releasing factors, liberins and statins, substances which cause um, stimulation of anterior lobe of pituitary gland to produce hormones which will afterwards stimulate production of other glands as a glands. Posterior group of nuclei uh, is presented by two nuclei. Uh, it is medial and lateral mammillary nuclei. They, they work as subcortical centers of olfaction. And also lateral group of nuclei, it's actually only one nucleus. It is mm, <clears throat> It is a subcortical uh, dorsal nucleus, only one nucleus, Luisi nucleus. It is uh, like integration center of hypothalamus and it regulates functions of all the other groups of nuclei. So about hypothesis, yes, we have already said that in posterior lobe of pit, uh, pituitary gland, or its other name is neurohypothesis, hormones are not produced, they are just stored. And so it is oxytocin and vasopressin, two hormones, yes. And in anterior lobe of pituitary gland, five tropic hormones are produced. It is thyrotropic that regulates function of thyroid gland, prolactin that regulates lactation, production of breast milk after the childbirth, adrenocorticotropic hormone that acts onto the, affects the adrenal gland, adrenal cortex, yes, somatotropic hormone or growth hormone that acts onto all body tissues, especially bone, uh, muscles, and adipose connective tissue, uh, gonadotropic hormones, they are two, FSH and LH, follicular stimulating and luteinizing hormone, which acts onto the gonads, the ovaries and testes, yes. And in some books it's written that there is middle loop actually in the hypothesis that produces this hormone. In some books it's written that it's also in the anterior lobe. It is a melanocyte stimulating hormone that in animals, in animals um, regulates um, color of fur, or yes, and in humans it acts onto the melanocytes uh, in the epidermis. That is the function of hypothesis. So that is all I wanted to tell you for today. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, so that is good. Uh, if you have no questions, then um, see you next time. Goodbye.